Hi everyone. First, I'd like to welcome all of you for being here today. As you know, the, the welcome remarks is always the least interesting speech of the day, and today will be no exception, but I will make it short <laughs> to limit your pain. So just to start this international conference, I'd like, to, uh, of course, all of you uh, to, to thank you for being here. We have people coming today from Senegal, Argentina, South Africa, Cambodia, the US and rest of Europe. So I'd like to pay our respect for those who, who come from far. Also to, to thank very warmly our internal team who, that organized the, this conference. Uh, I have Cecilia on my right, who did a really uh, a tremendous job to organize this day. Also Barbara, I don't see you right now, but uh, it must be, no, she's not there, but uh, I still <laughs> thank her. Elodie and Sylvie for the organization of the, of the, of the day. Just uh, wh why we decided to organize this conference with a number of partners also uh, sitting in front of me. Um, first, because um, we, we're concerned that the current transition, in particular the demographic transition, I'll, I'll come back to it, uh, might lead to uh, a huge increase in informal work, but also a huge increase in unemployment and, uh, and a huge dis I mean, despair all around the, the, the world, but, but most particularly in least developed countries. Uh, you, all, you all have in mind the number of uh, young people who will enter the labor market uh, each year. It's around 40 million people per year. And we are nowhere near a situation where we, we have uh, jobs and decent jobs for, for the youth. Uh, we, of course, uh, all have in mind what happened uh, around 10 years ago during the Arab Springs, where youth uh, emerged as a huge force to, to, um, to contest political uh, regimes, but also um, I'd say a few years uh, after, the, um, after the revolution, uh, a social situation which has not improved that much and, and therefore the political uh, changes have not necessarily been accompanied by social uh, changes or economic changes sufficient to answer the, the, um, the expectation of the, of the young people. So the, our, our main question is whether this, this is going to replicate in many more countries in the coming years. And, uh, the whole question I'd like to ask is whether we have solutions. I mean, what first, if we agree uh, on the terms of the debate and if we have solution on that. Uh, I'm also, of course, uh, thinking about uh, structural changes. Uh, we all think about the impact of technology, how this is going to change the demand for labor, uh, if, um, what kind of skills young people are going to, to need to, to get decent jobs. Probably the answer is very different uh, amongst the, the various continents. Uh, but I'd say as a, from a point of view of the development agency, uh, at least at AFD, huge concern on education quality. Uh, after the MDGs, uh, education has been massified but uh, did not necessarily le uh, lead to an increase in skills or, or employment capacity. Uh, the SDGs, to some extent, represent a progress because more qualitative indicators have been, uh, <coughs> have been introduced, real skills and capacity to access uh, job markets. But uh, it doesn't mean that public policies have evolved as quickly as, uh, as the index or indices on, uh, on the measurement of, uh, of uh, human capital. So if we have a major problem on human capital with basically uh, kids going to school but not necessarily learning enough, uh, things that we have observed in, uh, in Northern Africa might replicate uh, on a bigger scale. Uh, in a few words, what we do at AFD, <coughs> of course, our framework is the, S is the SDGs, I mentioned it, uh, with a particular focus uh, as far as we, uh, human capital is concerned on, uh, on uh, education quality. Also, our operations are uh, quite involved in social protection in a, in a wide sense. We might discuss exactly what, what that means because, in fact, it, uh, it, um, it, ev it evokes very different things, whether we work in China, in uh, South Asia, or in Africa. <coughs> so when we say social protection and decent work, we actually we, th we, we talk about very different things that colleagues wi will, uh, will complement later on. Uh, interest in decent work is a relatively new, um, new uh, source of, of uh, concern at AFD. It w we, we probably had uh, um, the willingness to increase uh, access to jobs, but the quality of jobs uh, is increasingly uh, a matter of concern. Uh, we used to have for a long time an interest in vocational training, uh, and access to, uh, to um, sustainable jobs, not necessarily formal jobs, but sustainable jobs and, and good paying jobs and decent jobs. 
but uh, the issue is with, is the, uh, with the numbers. Uh, since we, we do not train enough people in vocational training and nowhere near the 40 million people who will enter the job market each year. So this is why at uh, the research department we, we try at the same time to, to do research, with uh, most of the time with partners, so to, to assess the numbers, uh, to evaluate policies, and also to, to stimulate the international debates, uh, since I'm not sure we, we have a solution uh, at the sufficient uh, level and magnitude. So today, uh, the objective of the conference is first to, to show the latest research on, on work and decent work uh, in the world, to make stock of current evidence and organize a dialogue between uh, academics and practitioners. Uh, organizing this policy dialogue is extremely va valuable for us, and also to share experience from, uh, from developing and emerging countries as a way to explore and, and, and advise the countries that are going to, to enter uh, uh, a demographic, uh, a period where demographics is going to be the main parameter and, uh, and probably an, a dangerous one. Uh, Evidence-based, uh, well, I, I'll, go, I'll go quickly, but uh, just to tell you that uh, the, the question is how we ensure that uh, there's a better future, in particular for the most vulnerable. It's a challenge for development agencies to be able to reach uh, those in a population of a specific country most remote from the labor market. Uh, what policies we can design and advice we can give to, to countries uh, to support uh, informal workers and uh, how we can work on the conditions of work and not only the number of, of jobs. Today's program will have uh, three panels and main themes uh, that are going to be uh, dealt with today. The first panel will talk about uh, the social contract and how different experi experiences around the globe uh, can uh, can make sure that we can, can provide jobs to workers and decent jobs. Second panel will be on informality. Uh, you all know that about half of the world population works uh, informally, uh, with again uh, differences in uh, what uh, informal work uh, means, but uh, still the, the general idea is that half of the population is not in, uh, in the formal sector. And the last panel will be on actionable uh, responses and, and public policies. So without further delay, I will uh, leave the floor, have a great uh, conference, and again, many thanks for the colleagues who organized the, organized the day. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cecilia Paggi, and I'm part of the organizing team. And I have the uh, honor to uh, introduce you to uh, Andrew Green, who will be the moderator of this first uh, session of the day. Uh, uh, Andrew is uh, part of the uh, OECD Future of Work team, and uh, I leave you the floor to introduce the panel today. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, as Cecilia said, I've worked at the OECD on our Future of Work team. We've been working on the Future of Work at the OECD for about two years, and it's culminating in April, so in a few weeks, with our headline report on, on our headline employment outlook, which will look at the social contract and the future of work in OECD countries. So it's, we mostly work with OECD countries. There'll be a little bit, and we're doing increasingly uh, increasing work on the Global South. So we are very excited, I'm very excited to learn a lot and hear what um, our other stakeholders have to say. So this session is the um, future of the social contract. We're gonna start with Federica Saliola, who will give a presentation on um, new social contract to respond to the changing nature of work. Federica is a director with the World Development Report uh, from the World Bank. She's gonna be joined for the Q&A discussion by Simeon Jankov, also from the World Development Report from the World Bank. Next, we'll have Christina Berendt, the head of the Social Policy Unit in the ILO's Social Protection Department. She's gonna present a report inspecting how to strengthen the social contract for extending social protection to workers in the informal economy. And finally, our third presentation will be from Dr. Kate Phillip, a development strategist which, who will discuss how the future of work will look uh, and what the role is for the social contract to support the most vulnerable. So before we get started really quickly, each presentation will be 20 minutes. We're gonna hold all questions to the end of all presentations, so please take some notes and hold your questions. Um, Federica, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, so 
Uh, I will present some of the results uh, from the World Development Report 2019 on the change in nature of work. For those of you who are not familiar with the World Development Report, is our yearly uh, flagship report. We normally, what we do, we pick a very hot issue in the context of development. We'll look at the stock of knowledge out there and we try to reframe it. It's a good opportunity for us to put forward our views, but also to learn um, you know, for our work and, and understand if the approach that we follow so far is the, is the right one. So um, I don't know whether my presentation will be uh, up there, but let me begin by saying that um, you know, the discussion around the social contract has you know, played a big role in the context of the research that we did over the past year and a half. The report was released in October. Why? Because we see that there are all pressures on the social contract that were not resolved, and now there are new pressures on the social con that are uh, social contract. Sorry, they are coming from the change in nature of work. Um, so we see that there is, first of all, a lot of you know pessimistic feelings around it, right? When you know you think about the future of work, the first thing that comes to mind is we will probably experience uh, jobless growth, and a lot of us will be replaced by robots, to the point that. When we picked the cover for the World Development Report, uh, we decided to, uh, in the end, pick a very nice painting from Diego Rivera, because when we tried different, um, you know, different uh, graphic designer, we constantly got the, um, okay, we constantly got uh, these pictures of you know robots shaking hands of a person or robots sitting in an office, so that shares the the negative feeling around this future of work. Uh, but we think that you know we need to reconsider those feelings and understand that yes, technology brings a lot of disruption, but also brings a lot of opportunities. That, as I mentioned, put a lot of pressure on the social contract, but also offers opportunities, you know, to be more inclusive and to um, you know thrive in this new world of work. And I just would like to. Um, you know, show you a very simple graph that summarizes those views and, and the challenge that we face. Um, so what we normally get, as I said, reading about the future of work is that, you know, imagine that this box, it's, you know, country, a generic country, and this is just the people that work in, you know, time T in a country. Now what happens, right, is that automation um, comes to the, to the labor markets, and then we face, of course, um, you know, lost employment in all sectors. Like those sectors are mostly routine-based, where you know the new technology can replace uh, human labor, which is true. And we see that although it's a mixed picture, especially in manufacturing, a lot of countries experience uh, job losses. But that doesn't mean that you know that's the only thing that those countries experience. Even if we look at Europe, over the past 18 years, more jobs have been created than they were destroyed. And Europe is a, is a, is a region that was hardly hit by the technological progress. The part of the story that sometimes we forget is that technology, yes, brings automation, but also innovation. We call it the other AI, right? And what automation does, it creates new jobs creates sometimes new industries, can just change tasks you know, within a sector, so create opportunities. Now, doesn't mean that those opportunities are for all, and that's the big challenge. Uh, a lot of workers are still in the informal sector. As you were mentioned, I know there is a session dedicated to that, but that a result that was really striking, right? Because if we thought that economic growth would be always accompanied by formalization of labor market, well, we need to reconsider that, because if we look at the share of informality over the past 30, 40 years, you see that on average it's been incredibly stable. Now, some countries managed to reduce it, but overall hasn't changed, despite economic growth, despite technological progress, and all the changes that we saw over the past uh, 30 years. Um, you know, we know that there, is, there are a lot of young people entering the labor markets, and oftentimes they are not equipped with the right skills to, you know, find a job in this new box. So, so we really need to think what are the policies that uh, would allow everybody to benefit from, from those opportunities, and how we can rethink the social contract in a way that everybody has equal opportunities. And, and we think that the, a new social contract needs to be 
centered and focused on investment human capital and investment social protection. And I'm going to tell you why. So let me just highlight a few uh, changes just before we move to, to the policy uh, discussion. Um, as I mentioned, manufacturing has changed. Um, you know, some countries saw, you know, a lot of job losses, some others less. In Africa, it's not changed. It's been 10%, the share of manufacturing over the past 30 years. But one change that uh, I would like to highlight is the different way we do business. Uh, thanks to the digital technology, which is part of the story that sometimes, you know, get a little bit um, forgotten, overlooked, right? We always think about robots, but this is a technology that is not expensive um, and is really impacting the way we do business across the globe. Why? Because through these technologies, we observe the rise of digital platforms. And those platforms, they're not physical firms. They really exist on a cloud. That means that they can run business in a country even if they're not physically present in that country. They can bring opportunity to remote areas provided that we have the broadband infrastructure in that remote area and we have the right skills. You know, uh, the Taobao Villages, which is part of the Alibaba Group, recently created 1.3 million jobs in rural areas. So people move back from urban to rural areas. You know, they, they increase the proximity to the market. You know, we see a lot of digital platforms helping farmers, for example. So they really change, you know, the, the reach of the companies, you know, with less obstacles than we saw in the past. So, so here it is an opportunity that, of course, comes with a lot of challenges because we know that those platforms, you know, avoid taxes, they avoid, you know, competition, but, but that's, you know, something that if you're interested, we can discuss later. Another important change is how people work. We see less <coughs> traditional nine to five jobs, right? Which if you think of all these, you know, young people entering the market, we estimate that, you know, we'll have to create about 600 million jobs and that, you know, is 10 million for the Middle East and North Africa, 15 million in Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a big challenge uh, that we face and we see that these young people more and more often either they don't have a job because you know they don't they're not enough private sector jobs or they enter the market through what we call the gig economy right they have more temporary jobs they are freelancers which is in a way good because you know they can access the labor market but you know at the same time they get no social protection so there is no stability in those jobs and that is becoming more and more the rule not just in high-income countries, but in a lot of emerging countries and, and uh, developing ones. And then a third change, which is very important, when we think about um, the demand for skills. So I, I want to show you this graph because uh, oftentimes what we hear, which is something that we fully support, is that you know, we'll have to focus on those skills that um, robots cannot easily perform, right? So social behavioral, the higher the cognitive skill, the ability of think critically, working a team, those are things that at the moment, right, technology cannot really perform well. But it's not just black or white. So what this graph shows you is the pace of the technological advances. And you see that this, uh, this industrial revolution is really featured by a very fast pace. Right? We see jobs coming to the market literally overnight. So that means that, yes, we need to invest in certain skills, but we need to be adaptable. And that's the most important thing. How we can make workers adaptable so the skills can be transferred from one job to the other, but also they can be easily acquired, those new skills. Because we really don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You know, we have four million app developers in India at the moment, and you know, that, that they really came to the market in a matter of a few months. So we, we, we live in a very um, uncertain uh, future. So adaptability is very, very important. Now, <clears throat> the question is then what we could do to uh, be an inclusive society, uh, to give everybody equal opportunity. And as I mentioned, we think that we need to have a new social contract center on better investment in human capital and better investment in social protection. Why we talk about human capital? Because if you have human capital, you are more adaptable to change. Normally, people with high, um, higher human capital thrive, right, when there are te te changes, especially technological changes in the market. 
And, uh, um, you know, there are many things that are important in that context, but definitely a basic human capital is its key. Well, now, when we look, um, you know, across the globe, unfortunately, we see that uh, we're not there yet, right? We see that a lot of people don't have basic health and they don't have basic education. A lot of kids are in school, but they don't learn. More than 250 million kids and youth are not in school. Um, you know, the adult survival rate is pretty low in a number of countries. So, so in the report, we came up with a new index, which is what I'm showing you here, which is based on very simple indicators that related to basic human capital, with the idea that we can compare countries at least on those, you know, fundamentals, right? But it's not enough. Uh, to be adaptable workers, we need to start early. So early childhood development is extremely important because that's where the age when we learn to learn, between three and five. So if we miss that window, it's really hard to, to make it up because learning is cumulative. And 260 million kids across the globe don't get uh, proper early childhood development. And those kids come from poor backgrounds. So if we think about social contract, what can make it stable, that's where we need to focus our attention. But also, you know, we need to think after, right? We, if, let's say, everybody gets proper early childhood development, then we have, um, you know, basic human capital. What happens after? If technology changes uh, the opportunities and the type of jobs that fast, and uh, so it's not enough to have, you know, the right skills time T because things keep changing. So we need to think in terms of lifelong learning, right? And, and tertiary education plays a big role in that context because they can teach us those transferable skills that we can really learn in secondary school. Um, you know, they can accompany us throughout our working life si cycle, but also they could be a platform for innovation, right, which also helps to connect the supply and demand that oftentimes don't communicate well with each other. So better investment in human capital from the, you know, basic investment to, you know, a longer, um, let's say, working life cycle. So we start when we are three to learn how to become more adaptive, uh, adaptive and um, productive workers, but we need to continue after we finish uh, secondary school. And then uh, um, a second element of the, uh, the, human, of the social contract, it is investment in social protection. Why? Well, as I mentioned, this is one of the most striking results, right? We look at, we, we uh, analyze informality across different groups, um, by gender, by location, but you know, overall, this has been remarkably stable. You know, 65% overall in emerging economies, and it was 65% 30 years ago. But now what's happening is that we see a convergence, not in the direction that we wanted to see, because all these gig workers face exactly the same issues of informal workers. So they don't get any social protection, same thing. So then we wanna rethink social protection uh, in a way that is decoupled by having that formal traditional job that so far very few people have. If you look at the social protection in, the, in the poor countries, about 18% of workers get social assistance, which is income, and 2% get social insurance. So it's really a minority. And, the, and you know, the same doesn't change if you, that much if you look at middle income countries. So, you know, social insurance has been expanded over time because of these problems, right? If the majority of workers in a society are informal, then, you know, th th that kind of uh, reach is lacking. So then we wanna rethink our approach to social protection. And we do it in, in let's say, in three steps, or, you know, looking at three elements. The first one is that, you know, uh, the, the mm, minimum, the income should be universal, of course a minimum, um, what we call the society minimum, right? So everybody needs to have that minimum income that allows people to be flexible, to adapt to the market, and, and you know, to have that minimum stability it also allows you to reskill and move from one job to the other. Need, this needs to be complemented by social insurance. Now, 
you know, we, we don't, um, we totally support the current system for former workers. So if you have a job, it is mandatory to have social insurance. By right? that means pension, but also means uh, health insurance. But for the poor, this needs to be subsidized. So the idea would be that this um, societal minimum, which is income and, and insurance, would be universal. And as I mentioned, subsidized as needed. So it doesn't depend on you know, whether you have this formal traditional nine to five job. Now, if people get protected in this way, then we also need to think how we can create jobs and allow firms to go through transition too. So we also need to think how labor, labor market regulation can be more balanced so also firms can adjust to the changes because oftentimes it's, it's also a challenge for, to, for the firms, right? To adjust to the changes that uh, we see in labor markets. So, so the idea then would be to um, have universal social protection, but you know, more balanced uh, labor market regulation. And finally, um, you know, when we think about this uh, you know, new social contract that is you know, centered on, on human capital, centered on social protection, we also need to think, is that sustainable? Because we also wanna find um, some stability on that, right? We don't wanna find uh, countries ourselves in a situation where, you know, we all wanna invest on that, but, but then, you know, it's not sustainable because countries don't have resources. So, so what we did, um, you know, we, we try to think, okay, you know, if countries decide to invest uh, on those two pillars, what would be the additional cost in terms of GDP? And that's pretty high. Like on average, it is between six to 8% additional in the GDP, which is uh, you know, pretty uh, challenging when we think that that's where we are in terms of uh, tax revenue. Uh, the yellow line represents the low-income countries and you see that is around 10%. So it's gonna be very hard for them to um, you know, face the challenge and, and find additional resources. So without the objective of being prescriptive, um, you know, we have uh, some ideas on how countries can, can improve tax collection. Some countries, of course, uh, will, will, will need some help. I just wanted to show you how much would cost um, uh, universal basic income uh, for different group of countries. Um, you know, this is a very hotly debated topic. A lot of uh, poor countries are considering a universal basic income thinking that that would, you know, solve the issues that I mentioned and, and, you know, would create a better social contract for their societies and improve the relationship between, right, the government, firms, and, and people. But in, in a country like Nepal, for example, which belongs to the uh, first two bars, so if you think of universal basic income that will close the poverty gap, that would be about 20% of the GDP. So it's pretty high. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, there are some ideas. Uh, taxing digital platforms would uh, bring a lot of revenues for countries, and this is not just high-income countries. Actually, they're very present in a number of uh, uh, developing and emerging countries. Um, you know, and there are other um, ideas. The energy subsidies are very high in a number of countries. You know, the VAT do not exist. So there are just some ideas, but this is a big challenge. And, what we wanted to um, put on the table of policymakers when considering this new and better investment is also to think about you know, the financial part of that as they think how we can uh, um, you know, create better uh, equality of opportunity in the country through better investment in human capital and social protection. And uh, with that, I will, uh, would like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. It's really a, a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I'm not sure, should I? No, can I just? Uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank, thanks a lot. And um, so let me just. Uh, and I, th I think um, it's it's complementing actually quite well uh, what you have just heard from from Federica. Um, and I would like to kind of dig a bit, de a, a bit deeper uh, into the question of how to extend social protection to workers in the informal economy. And uh, with a pers uh, specific perspective of strengthening the social contract. 
And indeed, um, <coughs> social protection is really one of the key elements of, of a social contract, certainly not the only one, uh, but it is a very uh, important um, element of the social contract. And But when we talk about the global south and when we talk about developing countries, uh, many people would actually question uh, that there is actually a social contract. Um, because, I mean, the why, how we think about uh, the social contract um, in developed countries, this is very much uh, about fairness, about equity, about social justice, and it's also very much about the relationship between different groups of societies and also very much about the relationship between the states and citizens. And, and actually, when we think about developing countries, many people would ac actually question that. Um, especially when it comes to the role of the state, because I mean, many people don't really perceive um, the state as being an institution that really cares for its citizens. And I think this is one also one of the core issues that we see w when it comes to informality, because I think the informality is really the absence of. Um, of the kind of the regulation and, and, and policies that work. And, and this is one of the reasons why we see informality in, in, in many countries. I mean, there's a, it's a complex, it's a very complex picture, but I think when we think about um, strengthening a social contract or building a social contract, I think this is really something we need to, we need to consider. So let me um, just, um, oh, I just realized that there's a, a bit of a problem with my slide. Um, just let, let me just start with one, with one figure. 55% um, of, of the global population, so the majority of the uh, global population does not have access uh, to social protection at all. And this is not just people not receiving benefits, this is people not receiving benefits and not being protected in case um, they should fall sick, um, in case um, I mean, whatever can happen in case of maternity, in case, uh, in case people have an accident uh, at work. So this is really um, a, a huge challenge. So we're talking about 4 billion people. And 45% uh, um, of the global population it has some form of social protection coverage. But not necessarily um, the kind of complete protection that we would like to see, but quite often it's a bit patchy. So people might have access to healthcare, but they might not have access, um, they might not have, for example, a pension when they, when they become old. So this is really a huge, uh, a huge challenge. And in many countries, um, the social protection systems actually look quite patchy. Um, I've tried to um, show it here in this, in, this, in this graph. So we have a more or less good protection for those who are in the, in the formal sector, for those who are in the formal economy. Um, we have some kind of safety net programs for the poor, and we might have some for the people in the middle, and this is where we talk about most of the informal economy. Um, but this is not systematic, it's not equitable, it's not sustainable, and so there's a big question about how to cover the poor, but there's also a big question of how to cover um, what is sometimes being called the missing middle. Um, because the fact is um, also people who are not the ver most vulnerable, but those who are um, just kind of struggling to get along every day, but the lack of protection actually throws them back into vulnerability every, every day. And this is to a large extent um, linked to underinvestment in social protection. And this is both the cause and the consequence of the lack of social protection and informality. So this is very, very closely linked together. And if you look at actually at the, um, the levels of informal employment, um, it looks very similar to the map that we <laughs> just saw, saw before. So I mean, this is very much very much linked together. Um, and also the question of, I mean, informal, informality or informal employment is being defined in many countries actually by the lack of social protection. 
So this is really kind of one of the key criteria that, that are used to define it. And so if we don't want to accept this level of informality, uh, the first thing what we need to do is to think about how to ensure better protection. And social protection is one part of the answer, but it's not the only part of the answer because we also need to think about labor protection. <coughs> we need to think about employment policies. We need to think about labor market policies. And so, so if we look at the multiple drivers of informality, um, there is a very complex picture. I mean, one of it is the in inability of the economy to create enough formal jobs. This is obviously um, uh, uh, an important one, quite often linked uh, to low productivity, quite often linked to inadequate or absent regulatory frameworks, uh, to weak enforcement systems, um, and also kind of the lack of transparency and accountability of public institutions. And here again, we're back at the at the social contract. So where is the social contract in that in that in that context? Um, the lack of workers' voice and representation, and again, coming back to the question of the lack of social protection. And again, this is both a cause and, and a consequence um, of informality. But I think we need to um, unpack informal employment a bit more. And I mean, we don't have the time to go really into, into much steps. Um, and I'm certainly not going to present you everything that's on, on that slide. But I think what we need to um, consider also is that uh, when we talk at informal employment, this is not monolithic. Um, we talk about very different ways of informal employment. Uh, we talk about, for some people, um, dependent employment, people uh, who have an employment relationship in some way or another, who have an employer. We talk to a large extent about self-employment, and this is actually the large majority of those um, who are in, in informal em employment. And we, we talk about um, different degrees of control also that people have um, on their, the way how they're working and the way how they're uh, living. Obviously, there's very important gender uh, differences also in that, in that respect. Uh, women tend to be kind of found more at the at the bottom of that pyramid that you see there in, in the more kind of vulnerable forms, especially when it comes to unpaid family workers. Um, and we have very different levels of earnings. Uh, we have very different ways of how stable people's employment is. And when I talk about employment, I mean both dependent employment uh, and self-employment. So I think... Um, unpacking that is, is important. And, and also, I mean, and, and I think this was also mentioned by, by you, Federica, um, the, the question of the, the future of work and the kind of the m precarious forms of employment we see uh, associated with the future of work, for example, when we think about uh, crowd workers, uh, people in the, in the gig economy. I mean, if you look at the quality of their, of their work, if you look at the stability of their jobs, if you look at their incomes, um, they, they might have a better income, but in, in, in especially if you look at people in developing countries. But uh, if you actually look at the figures and if you look at the wages, especially if you count in uh, the time that people spend on searching for their the new tasks that they do in these on these on these crowd work projects, we talk about very very um, low wages, especially if you take that that into account. And that is true for both for those who are engaging in those <coughs> platforms in developing countries and also in in developed countries. Um, but then, obviously, when we talk about um, about developing countries, um, I mean, one part of the of the, the question is, what about those who are engaging in the kind of the new forms uh, of employment? But we have a lot of the, what we might call the kind of the old forms of employment, which are kind of people in the, in the rural economy, rural workers, uh, street vendors, um, um, I mean, we, subsistence farmers. So, I mean, we have very kind of different heter heterogeneity 
um, of situations, and we need to find solutions for, for them. So, and just one point um, on, on that, because, I mean, when we talk about the underinvestment in social protection, uh, it is not only a social challenge, but it's also an economic challenge. Because especially if you think of people um, who are self-employed, um, for them a social risk immediately translates into an economic risk. So if I don't have um, if I don't have a health insurance, if I don't have access to health services, um, my health problem immediately translates into a business problem. Um, and it, the same is true um, if someone kind of employs other people. Uh, the fact that the lack of health coverage um, quite often translates um, into uh, through the kind of informal support mechanisms because, I mean, people, they take care of their workers, but it means they take care of their families. They take care of, uh, not only of their immediate families, but also of the larger families back in the, in the village. So um, the lack of social protection immediately translates also into kind of a business risk and a, a risk for the, for the livelihoods uh, for, those, for those people. So, so what can we do? And again, I'm showing you this graph very, very quickly that you've already seen before. Um, so in order um, to extend social protection to workers in the informal economy, and I just realized that my slide is not, not in the way I created it. It was um, moving forward. Um, but I think, I think there, there's two dimensions, actually, um, of bringing social protection to workers in the informal economy. Um, one of it is the horizontal dimension. This is really about making sure that everyone has at least the basic level of protection. And this is what we call a social protection floor. And making, making sure that people have at least that basic level of protection, it's not, um, it's not meant as a kind of as a UBI. I mean, a UBI could be, in theory, could be one form of providing it. But the way the ILO looks at it, and when, we, when I speak about the ILO, it's not just kind of the ILO sitting in Geneva, um, but this is what the governments and the employers and workers um, of the ILO, kind of 187 member states have agreed. Um, this is about a guarantee. It's about a guarantee so that the state takes responsibilities and says, we guarantee that everyone has at least a basic level of income security, that everyone has access to health care. And there are different ways of providing it. Um, there are ways of providing it through the social protection system, but there's also ways of providing it, for example, through minimum wages <laughs> or through um, uh, mechanisms to strengthen entrepreneurship uh, in, a, in a way that really ensures that people also have social, social protection. So, the social protection um, policies are not the complete kind of answer to that question, but it's really about a broader policy package. But guaranteeing this basic level is not enough. We need to think um, about how we can really ensure an adequate level of protection, not just a basic level. And there, for that, we need to also look into the contributory mechanisms. And we need to look um, into social insurance and other forms of collectively financed um, social protection mechanisms. And these are already um, there, working more or less, or, less, or less well for those who are in the, in the formal economy. But we need to extend them. We need to make sure that they are extended and we bring more, more workers in. And, um, there's a number of countries uh, who have already done that by really adapting the way how these, um, these um, programs work, how to adapt them, because um, this is necessary. And again, talking about the social contract, this is, solid, this is about the solidarity um, among different categories of workers. This is about solidarity um, between employers, that is those who are benefiting um, from labor um, and the workers. 
And this is about really solidarity at the, at the larger scale. So in, in that, and, and this, is, this is something, and this is why the ILO is also insisting so much about these kind of collectively financed uh, mechanisms, um, because this is not individual savings. Um, because, I mean, for individual savings, everyone sa saves for himself or, or herself. This is really about mechanisms. I mean, individual savings can come on top of a solid social protection system, but it's important to have the basis, um, the basis right. So I see <laughs> the time. Um, so let's let's look in a bit more concrete detail of how that can how that can happen. And um, when we look at constraining factors, I mean, what is what is keeping keeping us from from really extending social protection? to those who are not yet covered, to those who are in the informal economy. There are several elements to that. Um, it might be that the, the laws which are in the country simply don't cover them. They, don't, they might not cover domestic workers. They might not cover agricultural workers. They might be excluded. Um, so there might be a lack of information, awareness, and very importantly, trust. Uh, the benefits might not be aligned with needs and priorities. There might be limited contributory capacity. There might be inadequate financing arrangements. Uh, people ha might have concerns about the general cost of formalization. Uh, there might be complex and burdensome administrative procedures and services. There might be weak enforcement and poor compliance and a lack of representation and organization. So these are all um, barriers um, to coverage. But there's ways of addressing them. And um, just showing very, very briefly uh, the example of Latin America, and this is actually regional, regional figures. I don't want to go into the detail. Um, but what you, what you see here in the left panel looks at health protection, the right panel looks at, at pensions. So for different categories um, of workers and employers are included here, here as well. Um, Obviously, you have different levels of coverage. Um, so those who are kind of closest to um, what is sometimes called the kind of the standard employment relationship, which in actually in, in with respect to social protection um, is not a very useful term, um, they have the highest level of coverage. Um, but then if you look at other categories, um, of workers, if you look at workers in small enterprises, domestic workers, um, self-employed workers, they obviously have much lower levels of coverage. But what has happened in Latin America, which has a quite a long history of working towards a formalization, is that for all of those categories, actually, the, the coverage rate have, have increased. And so just looking, oh, sorry, looking at some of the ways um, in which, um, in which it has increased. And this is just examples from Latin America, but also from other regions. Um, so when we talk about the legal frameworks, um, extending legal coverage, taking into account the specific um, situation of different types of workers has actually worked very well in many, in many countries. Um, then offering a attractive benefit packages that meets people's needs and also quality services has helped. When, it, when we're talking about the financing uh, mechanisms, so a lo several Latin American countries have simplified and adapted tax and contribution payment mechanisms. It's what they call the monotributo uh, mechanisms. Or for example, Ghana has extended um, the coverage of health insurance by using a, what they call a syntax um, this is a VAT on alcohol, tobacco, and luxury goods to subsidize uh, low-income workers and to subsidize um, categories which are exempted from, from contributions. Um, then there's a great potential in really um, streamlining administrative procedures and good governance, facilitating access, simplifying procedures, and ensuring better portability and transparency. Um, reducing fragmentation in the social protection system. Um, then awareness raising is very important. Um, for example, countries like uh, Uruguay, they have incorporated uh, social protection as part of their school curricula so that people 
um, or children learn immediately um, about their social protection rights, but also about their, their obligations. Um, then looking at more effective enforcement and compliance, so strengthening incentives for compliance. Um, and then looking at the organizations of workers, um, there's uh, many examples from countries um, like, <laughs> uh, for example, like uh, Costa Rica, for example, or the Dominican Republic on partnering with workers' organizations to facilitate access to social protection. So I have only one minute left. Um, so I think what is um, important is that there are ways of really adapting the social protection systems in a way and looking at both the tax finance mechanisms and the social insurance mechanisms to really ensure that they can actually respond uh, to the challenges ahead, both with regard to the old and new forms of, um, of informality and lack of coverage. So I just want to use this last minute um, to just give you uh, a very uh, brief, it's not even a summary, it's, a, it's an extract um, from the recommendations from the Global Commission for the Future of Work. They have published, it's an independent commission, a global commission which is co-chaired or which was co-chaired by the President of South Africa and the Prime Minister of Sweden. They have published uh, their report in February, uh, no, sorry, in January, and have come up with a very ambitious um, human-centered development agenda for the future of work. And I don't have the time um, to go through it now, but I would really invite you to have a look at the at the report, and just I've just extracted um, what they have to say on on social protection, um, basically emphasizing the need to have strong and responsive social protection systems that ensures the universal social protection from birth to old age and for workers in all types of employment. And the big challenge is here to cover those who are not yet covered, especially those in self-employment through adapted mechanisms and appropriate mechanisms. Um, they have emphasized very strongly the principles of solidarity and risk sharing. And really, um, in order to support, uh, to meet people's needs over the life cycle and really help people also to navigate that more frequent transitions that people are going to face in the, in the future. Um, so, and they have also emphasized the need to build a very solid social protection floor that affords a level of social protec of protection to all in need, but also emphasizing the need to not just limit it to a floor, but really be um, built social protection systems, which also provide higher levels of protection um, through appropriate uh, mechanisms, uh, based especially based on collective financing mechanisms. And they've also cautioned uh, against um, individual savings to replace the collective refinance mechanisms. So basically um, emphasizing the fact that they can also only be a voluntary option to top up uh, the stable, equitable, and mandatory social insurance benefit. And finally, um, just reminding ourselves that we have only 11 years to make social protection a reality for all. Thank you. Good morning, and it's a real pleasure to be part of this discussion. I'm going to be focusing on the future of work for those without it, uh, for people who are left behind by the transitions that we hope will follow for many through the investments in human capital. But the future of work is probably a bit of a rocky road, and we have to assume that not everybody will be able to make those transitions. In the context of the social contract, I'm from South Africa, I'm South African, and um, our transition from apartheid is often held up as an example of a social contract in action. And it certainly was. For a period, we had what Mandela called the Rainbow Nation. The problem is that right now, that is fraying at the edges. It's under stress, and it's under stress because of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And in the end, unemployment, poverty, and inequality are actually at the heart of any social contract now and they will be in the future too. So I'm going to reflect a bit on what that means. 
I also want to look just a little bit at where employment and participation in work, which are not entirely the same things, but where those fit into our idea of the social contract. And to get just a little bit philosophical, I mean, the social contract, in essence, is it's an outcome of power relations. It's an outcome of the extent to which constituencies in society are organized, are able to organize to assert their needs, their rights. And in essence, the social contract, whether it's explicit, as it was in South Africa in the negotiated transition, or whether it's implicit, um, is about who contributes what to the greater good, who can expect what, on what terms, um, in return for what rights and protections from the state. And that is an area of contestation in every society. Typically, the social contract assumes that those who are able to contribute to society, to contribute to the greater good, do so. And in return, the society <coughs> protects all, including those who are unable to con contribute. But in, within that is great contestation over who are the insiders and who are the outsiders. It's an issue to do with migrancy at the moment. Who, are the in, who, who deserves protection? So these are, the, these are the power struggles that go on implicit in, in the social contract. And I use that term contribute in inverted commas because how we define a contribution to society is also highly variable. Are artists contributing to society? Are unpaid care workers contributing to society? Different societies value those things differently. In my view, unfortunately, the notion of contribution to soci society has narrowed to often be interpreted as simply a productive contribution, a contribution through work and through employment. And the discourse on the social contract also is highly diverse. At one end of the spectrum, it is about reciprocity, about solidarity, about rights and social protection. But there's a darker end of the spectrum too, the discourse of shirkers, of non-contributors, of people who are dependent, who are not self-supporting. And it's a very strong discourse in many societies. There is social negative sentiment towards the shirkers, the non-contributors, and we see it in the public discourse. And it begs the question, within the social contract, if we expect everybody to contribute, what is the responsibility of society to ensure that everybody can? And in a way, that's what I'm going to focus on here. Because these discourses also impact on the meaning of work in society and how that meaning is understood and internalized by people. For many, of course, participation in work provides the means of living. It's also the means for improving the quality of life beyond just minima. But participation in work is about more than just income effects, social reproduction effects. The need to contribute to society is often deeply internalized as part of the social contract. Economic participation is also a marker of transitions to adulthood. The discourse that says we will support children, but adults must contribute to the society is deeply internalized. And so if you have not made that transition, you are still a child. And this is very much part of the social construction of masculinity in many societies. So when that opportunity to transition is absent, it has enormous social consequences. The workplace, if you're employed, but the marketplace, if you're self-employed, also performs crucial social roles that perhaps we're now underestimating in terms of things like multiculturalism. For most people, moving outside of the frame of the family and its networks is something that happens through work, through participation in work. Similarly, gender equality, the big gains were not made from within the household. The gains trickled from battles in the workplace. Economic participation builds capabilities, life skills, self-discipline, teamwork, all the adaptive skills that we heard about come partly from the experience of participation in work. They're not learnt at a desk or learnt outside of those processes. Accountability, collective organisation, these things don't just matter for the economy. They're intrinsic to our societies. They matter for society as a whole. And so when they're absent, when the opportunity to participate in work, whether that's in an employment or in other contexts, it takes different forms, but it has huge social, co huge so social costs in terms of people's sense of self, sense of their self-worth, sense of what they contribute to society. And what this means is that employment or participation in work 
matters too much, not just to the economy, it matters too much to society to leave to markets alone. That is not a new insight. It's an insight that informed the commitment to full employment that was very prevalent and remains within many of our global social contracts. It's in the UN Charter, it's in the ILO's Philadelphia Agreement, the conventions, it's in the SDGs. We talk about full employment, but is it fair to say that at present it's honoured more in the breach? So in the post-war period to the 70s, full employment was an overriding goal of economic policy. It drove macroeconomic policy, and unemployment was largely held under 2% in the developed world. But since then, and I want to use a quote here, the concept of systemic failure as a cause of unemployment has been replaced by sheeting the responsibility for economic outcomes onto the individual. We've seen a shift from a commitment to full employment to a focus on employability, a focus on capabilities, and important as it is, on human capital as the solution to unemployment, rather than recognizing that important as those things are, there are sometimes structural constraints and barriers that go beyond that. So that employability is the focus of many active labor market policies, and again, important as they are, sometimes, and I certainly experienced this recently in Greece, the idea is that that is what stops people being em employed, regardless of the level of labor demand in the wider economy. And if human capital development doesn't work to get people employed, then the default is entrepreneurship. And again, important as that is in any economy, the idea of a zero-sum link that says you are unemployed, therefore your solution is you must become the entrepreneur, is where the weakness comes in. And it's part of this sheeting of responsibility onto the individual for what are societal structural problems. This idea that people must employ their own way out of poverty on market terms. In the process, and I have to give credit to Banksy here <laughs> for the image. In the process, primacy is given to markets in determining social outcomes rather than society shaping market outcomes. And the question this poses is what is the role of s the state and society more broadly in shaping markets instead? Not only now, but certainly in, re in re relation to the future of work. And of course the state has many instruments with which to do this. Plan A is all those things on the left. Every single one of those is an area of contest in societies. What should the role of the state be in relation to full employment, in relation to macroeconomic policy? Should there even be industrial policy? These are all highly contested areas. But on the left, plan A, these are some of the many instruments the state has to ensure market-based employment outcomes. That's plan A. My argument here is that societies need a plan B. Because we have certainly seen in many instances that despite the best intentions of economic policy, we end up with gaps in employment. They may be spatial, they may be racial, uh, they may be gender-based, uh, they may be whatever. But the point is that with the best intentions in the world, market outcomes sometimes leave people excluded, some people excluded. Societies need a plan B. For when market responses still fall short, despite the best efforts of Plan A. And Plan B involves direct employment, forms of direct employment. Public employment programs, employment guarantees, the state as employer of last resort. And again, the reason it's called employer of last resort is because it's the last resort. <laughs> it's not where we start, it's not the priority, it's not Plan A. But when Plan A doesn't work, and with all the uncertainty that the future looks set to bring, we need a plan B, just like the British need at the moment. <laughs> plan B. Plan B is direct employment. And plan B offers a development instrument that can end in voluntary unemployment. And boy, do we need to do so sometimes. It does so when market-based approaches aren't doing what we want them to do and can have some interesting market effects too. And the challenge I'm putting here today is how do we reimagine this instrument? How do we reshape it and repurpose it to deal with some of the challenges in the context of the future of work? 
building on some innovation that is happening already today. I'm sure most people in the room will be familiar with the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, <laughs> NREGA, which is the world's first employment guarantee. It's not a full guarantee, it's rural. It offers 100 days of work per annum to every rural ho household for as many of those days as they need, whenever they need them. Very ambitious, 60 million people participating. There are many things one can say about Narega. The only thing I'm going to say right here is how it has illustrated the role of an employment guarantee as an instrument in setting a labor standards floor. We have many instruments for setting lab labor standards, minimum wages, regulations, so on. Our big problem is enforcement. Because unless people have alternatives, they become complicit in undermining the very regulations that are meant to protect them. Norega has, by, by paying minimum wages, Norega has increased market wages in many states in India where agricultural wages were below the minimum wage and were, in fact, poverty wages. Similarly, by paying equal wages, Norega has contributed to closing the gender wage gap. Providing people with alternatives needs to be part of our development toolbox when we are trying to ensure minimum labor standards. It's an instrument in the fight against working poverty and the erosion of labor standards that we anticipate and that we've heard from other speakers, we can anticipate as part of the future of work. In South Africa, we've used public employment to address the burden of unpaid care work. In every municipality in the country, people who were doing this work informally are now paid to do it. It's had really interesting impacts because care is, as we all know, an unresolved gender issue, unpaid care work. Paying for care through a public employment program gives it social recognition and it gives it an economic value. It's institutionalized community-based care and it's actually led to a discourse in which the possibility of more formal social investment, as is in WDR, more formal social investment in care is a real policy priority because of the way the public employment program has created a transitional form of formalization of that work. And care connects people. What it's also done, and I love this photograph because it just illustrates it so well, is it puts the social back into social protection. And too often the way we use the term social protection is reduced sometimes just to income transfers. And we need a more social understanding of what social protection means also as part of the future of work. In the process, what is interesting is how the public employment program has created a pathway out of informality for people who were working informally in this sector. At the same time, setting minimum standards for care with fabulous curricula developed for early childhood de development, supporting exactly the kind of human capital development that we were also hearing is needed as part of ECD. I would argue that a key role for public employment programs is also building the commons in the context of the future of work. In the community work program, which I've been very involved in, the work undertaken must be useful work. And the definition of that is simply work that improves the quality of life in communities that communities themselves prioritize. So it's become an instrument unlocking agency at the level of communities, providing a platform for organization and a platform for getting things done, which is so often so needed. And there's no shortage of work to be done in poor communities. And poor communities are typically best placed to say, we need A, B, C, and D in that order. Then providing also some accountability and oversight of the programs. Now, this is an area of concern in relation to the future of work. That, that world reduces social interaction in the workplace and beyond. We shop online, we go to work on the driverless bus, or we stay at home interacting with a screen. Our work is quality assured by an algorithm, and we come home and pick up a McDonald's burger from the robot. Now, okay, I'm exaggerating, but there is already talk of an epidemic of loneliness amongst gig economy workers, amongst platform workers, amongst people work working from home. Part of the discussion on the future of work needs to be a discussion on the future of society. We need new social instruments. We need new social institutions to build civic capital, social ties, networks, and social cooperation. 
public employment programs can be designed to provide one such instrument, institution, institutionalized through the mechanism of local government, that brings together those in work and those outside of work in new forms of community engagement. Now this slide is a lot, so let me just unpack it very briefly. What it is, is the outcome of crowdsourcing ideas for public employment from a community. And what you see here is the, the diversity of forms of work, because forms of public goods and services will also need to change in the context of the future of work. Um, and what I'm not going to go through them all, but what we see coming from communities is how they would deploy this labor in the public interest. Support to education, food security, art and culture, social care, youth employment, enabling entrepreneurial activity. All of these provide scope for forms of public employment. And public employment does not just have to be unskilled manual labor, which is, I think, perhaps the perception that many of us have of what public works programs or public employment has to be. And already we're seeing changes in this regard. So in South Africa, the city of Joburg rolled out free Wi-Fi. Nobody was using it. So they used youth to walk the streets and hook people up to the free public Wi-Fi, and they got paid for each connection made. It, they used a public employment model. In a really remote rural community, Bulungula, community radio links the villages, public employment. Youth were trained to do tablet-based local economic su surveys, GIS mapping of crime hotspots, collation of social histories, and Greece is a fascinating example where I was involved in supporting the government of Greece in the design of their public employment program. And the problem there was so many people who were unemployed as ma had master's degrees and were highly specialized. And so the form public employment took there was highly different. And we're going to see this in the future of work because the projections are that a lot of the jobs that will be lost are not unskilled manual labor. Those are included. But that middle band of, of, of often professional skills. So in Greece, we had, as part of the public employment program, psychologists, counseling communities, archaeologists, historians, computer scientists, creating interactive history programs, physiotherapists, providing services in, to old people in poor communities, translation, digitization, vets sterilizing stray animals. These are all public goods. These are all public services. These are all ways in which we can utilize labor through direct employment to minimize involuntary unemployment. And my last content slide. <laughs> public employment can also play a role in the kinds of transitions that people have been talking about. We're all agreed minimum incomes, incomes are vital, and that's a big enough challenge on its own, let me concede. But people do need pathways beyond minimum incomes also. We don't want a society in which some people transition into the cool new quality jobs and everybody else is on minimum income. That just reinforces the inequality that we're also worried about. So we need other pathways. The argument here is that employment guarantees all public employment programs targeted at people left behind provide a transition point from minimum income into participation in employment. And again, where labor markets um, enable this, that then puts them in a better position to transition into formal employment. With employment guarantees and public employment programs bridging that gap. And that we need to think about these as complementary and synergistic elements of a package of policies. Because participation in public employment programs exposes people to the world of work. It mitigates the negative social impacts of unemployment and the associated costs. It builds or maintains work readiness, reducing the loss to productivity that otherwise happens. And these are complementary, not binary policy choices. Too often it's presented as UBI versus employment guarantees, and that's a problematic formulation. So in conclusion, <laughs> there are many strengths and many interesting things in the debate so far, but I am going to say the emphasis on human capital and on equality of opportunity in the World Development Report matters, and it's a really important element and contribution. But I would argue that it's still a focus on employability and on capabilities that leaves out the problem of the structural constraints on the demand side. It leaves many current forms of power accumulation and inequality untouched, and there isn't much focus on the societal responsibility to ensure full employability, full employment, sorry. <laughs> the ILO's Future of Work Commission also many, many strengths, but although they do talk about full employment, the focus is on plan A. There's no mention of plan B. 
despite, ironically, the ILO's own strong 100-year history of actually spearheading public employment in many contexts. In both, the focus is on transitions and on social protection on, for those who can't transition, leaving a missing middle, I would argue. So, bottom line, employment matters too much to society to leave to markets alone. The social contract needs a clear commitment to full employment, not only to plan A, but to plan B too, so that involuntary employment and desperation are removed from the equation. Thanks. <laughs> well, I want to thank the uh, presenters for three lovely presentations. We are going to transition now to a little Q&A session. So we're going to turn it over to the floor right now for Q&A. Um, I saw a lot of people writing down furiously, so hopefully there are good questions. We would simply ask that before you ask your question, and I stress to hold it to a question, um, could you please introduce yourself? So yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. So my name is Leopold. I work for the Sahel and West Africa Club at the OECD. So I would, I wanted just to come back to what uh, Kate Phillips said uh, in the end about uh, the insufficient emphasis on the labor demand side. Um, my impression is that in many developing countries, a big um, phenomenon, an important phenomenon, is the urbanization and uh, the, mi the migration of people from rural areas to cities. And this creates obviously many economic opportunities, especially in the, um, in the food sector. And what we see is that there is sometimes not um, an emergence of many small companies that are able to upgrade the demand side and offer additional um, salaried jobs. So what would be your views um, regarding how governments can support um, small, small traders and small um, economic actors to offer more employment opportunities, especially in the context of urbanization? Thank you. Is this on? That is a problem, and I think it's a problem compounded by the impacts of climate change um, and climate adaptation, where some of the envisaged shifts in agricultural methods may also end up displacing, um, displacing people. And what we're seeing is that in many developing countries, um, the structural transformation that happened in the developed world uh, is, 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 is not an option. Um, that it's the kind of manufacturing jobs uh, that went along with urbanization in the developed world are not materializing in the same way um, in the developing world. And this is a huge, this is a, 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 a huge issue. I don't have a simple solution to that other than to say that the issues that you're highlighting all belong in plan A. Um, that governments need to look across the spectrum of instruments that they have available in their country context, given their comparative advantages, given their sectoral composition, um, that part of that also needs to be about organization of the constituencies involved. So what, is, what, are, what are traders in that context saying? How is the food economy structured in that environment? How can that be improved to enable more market-based jobs? I would argue, though, that th it's a classic case where complementing those strategies with direct public employment could provide people with income security, with an entry point into urban areas, with networks, with work experience that could then enable 
better outcomes um, at that level. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to Federica Sarir, but also to, to you and to who wants. Uh, it's about the end of, uh, my name is, sorry, Mohamed Marouani from the Sorbonne Institute of Development Studies. Uh, I wanted to start from the end of your uh, presentation where you talked about the cost. And um, I think probably it's the most important part because the political economy starts there. Who will pay this cost? Uh, and uh, I'll take the example of Tunisia that I know very well and the region in general, where uh, it's not just social protection. In general, in Tunisia after the revolution, the main issue is who will pay the cost? It's not necessarily presented in this way, this way in the debate, but actually it's really the, because uh, after the revolution, people think that uh, firms will pay, others that workers will pay, others that, and it's, an, I mean, we cannot really advance with this uh, because if you look at um, workers, the, they are represented by uh, uh, trade union, which represents only formal workers in Tunisia. So we don't have anyone who represents informal workers. So the poor are not really represented. Uh, and maybe the solution chosen has been the one you're proposing as your plan B, which is to create a lot of uh, public jobs, plenty of public jobs. Uh, but this has two other problems, creates two uh, other problems, which are, of course, debt, which is exploding, and um, sometimes uh, the quality of public service uh, that is becoming. So it's resolving an inequality problem and the uh, political problem, but it's creating new problems, which may have other uh, issues. So if you can comment on these political economy issues, I think they're really tremendously important. Thank you. Yeah, totally right. You know that that's the uh, the main issue, the political economy, because as you mentioned, there might be different bottlenecks depending on the country, different trade-offs, who pays for what, and which is something that I think we can provide a general response. Um, what I can tell that overall, an intervention from the government is needed, right? So imagine imagining a, a scenario where just let's say private sector companies contribute it's, it's definitely i would say very kind of a dreaming type of scenario um, and it really depends on the context because <coughs> as we show and i think kate also uh, discussed unfortunately in a number of countries the problem is exactly the lack of private sector jobs the lack of the presence of private sector firms so clearly an intervention from the government is needed. Um, but you know, there are also cases in which companies can contribute uh, to paying for social uh, protection. I guess uh, the point that we were trying to make is that depending from you know, different contexts, you know, it could be too expensive to put that burden only on companies. And they give you an example, uh, in Sierra Leone, if you fire a, f a formal uh, employee, th they left to pay severance, uh, you know, um, paychecks for about 120 weeks, right? So, so that's clearly a way you can say, okay, this might give stability and some security to workers once they get fired. But as you can imagine, you know, companies just do not hire, like they hire just informally. So <coughs> it is hard in those contexts to imagine that, you know, you can see a strong contribution from the private sector where the private sector really doesn't exist. So definitely an intervention from government is the first step. And, and oftentimes there is no such uh, incentive for policymakers to do that. Um, but in, as we transition to a better, more dynamic private sector, companies should intervene as well. Not only with minimum wage and the many tools that Christina mentioned, but also a lot of companies are doing, for example, some profit sharing, right? So they might not provide a minimum wage and, and all the things that we would like to see there, but you know, at the end of the year, based on the prof on the profit, they can uh, um, redistribute their income. So, <coughs> it's a really interesting question, and it is often the crux of the issue, um, the political economy. Um, I think it's worth looking at how India's managed to do it, um, and what the fiscal implications of that have been, and they seem to be managing to sustain that. Um, I think the other critical issue is to understand that the, the different ways of doing these things. So in India, it's a, it's a guarantee, but it's limited. 
it's 100 days a year. In South Africa, it's, it's limited by a, 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 a budget ceiling, but it's two days of work a week. Um, so, you know, you can design these programs to adapt to the, your areas of greatest need and your level of fiscal flexibility. One of the things I really liked about the WDR report was this emphasis on, okay, so how will governments raise additional revenue for these kinds of, of, of proposals? But I think that the conversation that we're not yet having sufficiently is the global implications, the global fiscal inequality. Mm -hmm. And what are the instruments for dealing with that? Because I don't think on their own, uh, the poorest countries, no matter how much they <laughs> manage to increase their own ge re revenue generation, can actually address these problems so solely within the economic bubble of their own economies. And I think with global inequality rising, one of the big questions is what are the global instruments that we need to come up with to start to rebalance at a global level. And then maybe also, also add, add to that, because I, I think, I mean, the, the issue of where do the resources come from mm -hmm. is really an, an essential one. And uh, the, the question um, is really to see how can we make sure um, that there are sufficient uh, revenues in, in terms of taxes, but also adding the, the contributions, because I, th I think this is um, an important also element, because, I mean, the, the question is really how much can you finance from the central government, from the government budget as such, um, and not, not forgetting also the social insurance as an important one. But I think, I think when we talk about uh, the, the central government, or the, I mean the, the overall, the general government, government budget, I think the issue of inequality um, is really a central one, and this is really core to the question of the uh, of the social contract. Because, and, and I think in 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 many ways also, the 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 challenge of informality, and I think we're going to hear more also about it in the in the next session, is also in a way, um, I mean, people are ready to contribute if they are. I mean, and contribute both in terms of contributions and taxes if they have the impression that everyone is contributing in an equitable way. Uh, and I'm just not, not, o not only talking about the contributions in a monetary way, but also in the broader way that you had mentioned at the beginning of your talk, um, also to think about the broader societal contributions, to think about also the unpaid work, etc. And I think this is really um, one of the big questions. How can we make sure um, that the way how everyone is contributing, and be it both, I mean, on the side of the workers, but also very importantly on the side of the enterprises, um, that we have more equality or more equity in the way um, people are contributing, and that you don't don't have free riders. Um, and maybe maybe just mentioning um, one example from from a recent ILO study. Um, we, we did a survey among, among crowd workers. Uh, I mean, people working on, on crowd work platforms like kind of Amazon, Mechanical Turk, and, and similar. And looking at the way to what extent they are covered in terms of social protection. And um, it was a global survey, but most, sur most people were in the, in the United States. Um, so and what we found is that half of them were actually covered. Uh, but they were not covered by the work that they did on these crowd work platforms. They were covered because they might have a, a job, a, another job, in addition to the work that they do on the crowd work platforms. They might be covered through um, their spouse. They might be covered through a job that they had previously. And this raises really a, l a big issue about really the, the equity. I mean, it's basically the traditional in a way, the old economy subsidizing the new economy. And this is a situation which is simply not sustainable and it's not, not equitable. So I think we need also need to talk about a kind of a level playing field. We also need about fairness in that respect. We need about ways how we can ensure a regulatory environment that really makes sure that we have these kind of contributions, equitable contributions from all those who actually can contribute. And I think this is one of the big issues that is really at, at stake here, especially when we talk about the social contract. J just one point to the political economy, uh, which is that there are some areas where um, 
if you look, you can find, I think, a significant majority for taxation. Uh, at the local level, one one such area is property taxes in large cities, not not on land, so not in rural areas, but in large cities. Uh, previously, it was very difficult if you didn't have cadaster to do this in countries, let's say, like uh, Tunisia. But now we have drones, so it's very easy to go and basically look around who has huge properties in the larger cities, and then make the political point which a number of countries have successfully uh, done, these people don't pay any taxes. So, and they have huge properties with pools, with jacuzzis, and, uh, and so on. That works. It's, it's mostly local taxes, so it's not going to resolve the larger issue of um, fin financing the social contract. But it may finance local schools, local hospitals, local, um, uh, local services in a number of different countries around the world, both uh, poor as well as mid middle income countries have lately done that. Uh, and then the other area is what actually Kate uh, uh, talked about several, uh, several times. I think in the vast majority of countries, at all levels of development, there will be a political consensus on taxing basically platform companies. Uh, why? Because most of the platform companies basically either come from the US or from China currently. So if you're in Europe, it's very easy to say these bad Americans are basically taking our money and putting them in the Caribbean or whatever, uh, whatever uh, else. And this money actually huge. It's not small amounts of money like the first. So in the WDR, we calculated how much money, Google, uh, sorry, how much taxes, annual taxes, Google pays. Because they always say, well, we don't pay here, but we pay there. So actually, we are great uh, global citizens, you know do no harm type of thing. So we've calculated for two years ago when the latest data were available that Google paid 0.7% uh, of their, uh, uh, of their um, uh, income, uh, sorry, of their profits uh, uh, globally if you calculate all the uh, taxes that they pay. Now the average in, 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 in Europe, uh, just the statutory corporate tax rate on average is around 22%. Companies don't quite pay 22%. There are also other exceptions and so on. But on average, they pay around 17%, one seven. So Google basically pays nothing. And then they go around and say how great they are and how great uh, the world will be with them. And Facebook and all of these companies, Amazon, some of the Chinese companies that are now are showing up. If you basically sum up just from the scant data that we have, this is like two, three, four percent annually of GDP that we are basically stashing, stashing away. On that, I think a number of countries can come together. It would be interesting whether the European Union would be the first. And basically, say we're going to tax that. So some uh, some countries like France is now starting to tax, UK is starting to tax, Italy is starting to um, uh, to to tax. But I think on that we can first get a regional agreement. At, at least within Europe, I think we can. Because within Europe, who is against? Luxembourg, because they evade taxes as much as they can. Oh, yeah. Ireland. And then the Netherlands, just, just to be uh, you know, on the safe side. But three relatively small members. So you should be able to bulldoze through them and say, we need these uh, taxes. And if you do, suddenly you have a lot more money than uh, you realize. It's not going to resolve the whole issue, but it's a big step forward. Um, uh, good morning, my name is Paul Bossens. I'm working for the Belgian Development Agency, uh, Bilateral uh, Development Agency. Um, my question was directed to Christina, but maybe the others can come in. Uh, I think it's overlapping, of course. Um, you talked about uh, fragile states, uh, but I see that in my environment, bilateral cooperation and, and so on, um, Actually, corporations are going away from fragile states. They want to work in fragile states, but not with them. They, they withdraw. They are uh, private sector development uh, um, objectives, which are actually uh, neglecting the role of the state, which several amongst you uh, stated. And then the whole question is, why is this tendency there? And, uh, and is this a good tendency? Uh, uh, basic education and, so, and, and, and health, for instance, my sector is health, uh, are not a fashion anymore. 
and we go for private sector development without social protection. Um, and then the second thing is I'm coming from a social sector. Uh, I'm very much aware of the need for and, and the, the, si the positive side effects for, 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 um, for a, a society as a whole if you can provide those services and, and this protection. But then whenever I subsidize, whenever I come in with money, they say, oh, but this is not sustainable. Is it worthwhile to subsidize? especially in very poor, fragile countries, is it worthwhile to subsidize and, let's say, postpone the question of sustainability to some destinies from here? I'll let you answer in that one. <laughs> 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 well, let, 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 me, let, me, let me try to, to, to do that. Uh, maybe, maybe starting with your, your second question. But I think it's very much uh, linked with the with the first one. Um, I, I mean, obviously, in, in many many countries there are actually kind of I mean huge difficulties, um, not just in kind of fragile context, but also uh, in contexts where, you, for example, I mean you have large refugee populations, etc. And there has been a tendency, and we very much welcome that tendency to really look at look at the ways how the more kind of the more short term interventions the more temporary interventions can actually at least in the longer run uh, be linked um, to the more kind of de developmental approaches and in the area of social protection it's particularly on really building social protection systems uh, rather than just having kind of short kind of individual short term short term programs and um, and obviously, and uh, as I think what you alluded to in your in your first question is also the question. I mean, the relationship that kind of external partners have um, with the state in a fragile state context, and um, towards uh, the the pressures really to deliver quickly, uh, especially in contexts where you have high levels of corruption, for example. Obviously, there is a tendency to say, well, I mean. Where we let's let's just kind of work the private way, basically, um, going around the state and going around public institutions. Um, but that actually, I mean, it might be kind of driven from some kind of valid short-term concerns. But then, if you think of it in the longer run, uh, it might actually further undermine um, the trust that people have in the in the state. And it might further undermine the why, how the social contract, however fragile it might be in such a in such a context, might be further further undermined there. And I think this is really a key a key issue where the question is, uh, even though it might be very difficult to work with a state uh, in a certain context, but at least having a vision to for the kind of the longer term to really see how can we make sure that we build the necessary capacities uh, in public institutions um, to actually be able to deliver what they should be delivering. And, and I think this is certainly something which is difficult to do from one day to the, to the other. But I think if we don't, I mean, if we as a kind of development community, if we don't do that, I think it will have negative consequences in the in the longer run, um, especially because we're further undermining um, that social contract which would should be should be there. Um, also in a in a way and coming back to the previous question, kind of who's who who contributes um, to a um, to the the broader social contract and I, th I think it's it's really very much about also um, developing the domestic financing capacities in that in that context, and this is something that um, should not be at least not in the longer run be kind of externalized. But I think it's also very much about making sure that those who should have the responsibility um, to pay are actually doing that. And uh, actually, the ILO works a lot. Also, I mean, we have a we're working with um, 
that kind of it's a bit taking away from the fragile context, but the ILO works a lot with uh, multinational enterprises uh, in the context of the global flagship program on social protection force that we have, because they're realizing whenever they're operating in certain countries where you don't have a good public social protection system, it's much more difficult for them actually um, to ensure that their own workforce, but also increasingly kind of the, um, the workers in their supply chains are actually uh, protected. And so there is a, it's a kind of a growing number of multinational enterprises who say, well, we want to work with you to actually make sure that we build up the public systems. We realize that um, the, um, if we do our own kind of individual uh, contracts with insurance companies, that's not really the way that is sustainable for us. We want to make sure that there is a good public social protection system in the country. And this is not just an issue about uh, kind of the corporate social responsibility type of work, but this is for them very much part of their core business model. And we would hope that more companies are actually realizing that and realizing how much they also have a responsibility in that in that respect. So I'm not sure whether. Okay, just one minute to say that your question about subsidies, um, you know, I guess sometimes they might be helpful when, you know, there is a lack of incentive to make a priority and investment that we only show results in the long run. And health is one of those sectors, education is another one. Right? Oftentimes policymakers, whether they have limited capacity, limited resources, they tend to invest on things that are more visible and they would just reinforce consensus for, you know, they work. So investment in education might just uh, you know, be able to impact the outcomes in perhaps 20 years. So I think in those situations, also the subsidies, provided they are part of a plan, building capacity, but also creating a, an enabling environment, um, I think is very important because if we just subsidize and nothing, nothing else changes, then when we stop the subsidies, nothing has changed. And I like Kate's um, you know, wording about they we only work on the employability, which is true. But you know, if there are no jobs, you can be you know employable. You can have all the right skills. But you know, if there are no jobs in the country, and I would assume even the public, uh, you know, employability programs, you know, can be just that. But in in you know, in the context of a transition, so working on a plan, right, and and you know, influencing other outcomes together with the one that we influence with the subsidies, I think would be key so that you know, this is supporting a transition. In, in the report, and that's the last thing I'm going to say, we showcase this uh, flex security system, for example, in the Netherlands and Denmark, where actually the governments come in when people lose jobs, so they need to move from one job to the other. But the, the, the market is so dynamic and thriving that as it just, you know, they temporarily support you because people will find a job right, very soon. They might need to you know, pause and, and reskill themselves uh, but it's never a permanent support, right? So it's, it's just in between two good outcomes. Thank you. I'm gonna ask one last question. We have like five minutes before lunch. Um, uh, we heard a lot about covering people under social protection and then informality platform work. And the implicit assumption seemed to be that social protection needed to change to cover people. And I guess the question I wanna pose to all of you is, can you really expand social protection without also expanding and codifying salaried formal employment? I mean, we know from OECD countries, the, one, the countries that really provide the best social protection are also the ones that really codify formal salaried employment. And we know from Christina's graph from Latin America, the, ones in sal the workers in formal salaried employment have the highest rates of social protection. So the question is, is it possible? And if not, does the sort of employer-employee relationship also need to change? And it's, it's to all of you. Okay, we'll go in order. I think it's definitely possible, and actually new technology allows uh, that to be done that previously was not possible, because until very recently, social protection was always given basically on the production side. You produce, you're part of a firm, and then through your company or through the government, 
if you work for the public sector, that's how you get your social protection. Now you can actually do it being a consumer because as long as you're consuming uh, and, you, and your pattern is no, known to us, the people who are going to give you the social protection, let's say the government, uh, and by that I mean if basically you're consuming, so to speak, using e-wallet or you know, your phone, uh, essentially, um, then we know how much you consume. We are not asking where your money came from, which is the important distinction. We're basically just observing that you know, every month you consume a certain amount of, uh, 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 of resources for basically your food, for your shelter, and so on. Then we can say, on that we can build actually both voluntary and mandatory social security schemes. We can say, for every dollar that you consume, let's say, um, two cents will go into another e-wallet or another part of your wallet, and on top of that, the government will match it. So that's where the subsidy component um, uh, comes. And there is a program that doesn't depend at all on uh, your uh, employer. And this is not hyp uh, hypothetical, actually. There are a number of countries and a number of large cities or states that within India, for example, uh, uh, Mexico City and so on, that do this quite, uh, quite successfully. You do need to have technology. The good news is that the cost of this type of technology now is basically zero. You can uh, spread it. You can spread it much faster than our eternal hope that everybody would have full employment. It's good to have it as a goal. I agree, we should always try that first, plan A. But in the meantime, we cannot wait for another 40 years to get to that. So we should uh, use this new technology on the consumption side. Yeah, no, I'm just, I totally agree with Simon, just you know, to reinforce that technology with the example of Mexico with the geospatial maps that could map out all the poor at the block level so they could deliver uh, social protection uh, to, to these people. We have a good initiative in the bank which is called I2, I, ID for D, sorry, ID for development because a lot of people also don't even have uh, ID, right? So then we provide a digital ID to people so then you can really reach out because the problem is that, um, you know, oftentimes we just don't know who are the poor that don't get social protection. So technology could help. Sometimes, you know, there are also some disincentives. We've been discussing a lot uh, using the digital technology for financial inclusion, right? Because now with the fintech, it, it, you know, we're able to provide small loans to people, not through the formal bank sector, but a lot of people also want to stay informal. So they don't use that technology uh, so that they can, you know, they kind of remain uh, in the darkness. So there might also be some, some uh, disincentives there. But one thing I want to say is that also for the gig economy, there are good examples of workers that actually get social protection. I think more and more companies are kind of shift, shifting the framework and finding ways to, um, you know, provide social protection. Not the best one, but, you know, rethinking the enabling environment in a broader um, way so that we can also include that component. And I just want to say that I like always to quote uh, our uh, senior director for social protection and jobs. They always say the best social protection is having a formal decent job. So we fully support that, but oftentimes that, you know, that would be always the optimal. But when that is not possible, you know, there are definitely ways to get to universal or at least more coverage, especially through new technologies. I really like the answers already given, so I'll just pass. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. I mean, um, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, there's a lot that can that can be done um, with technology um, in in the in really ensuring that everyone has access to social protection. But I don't think that we should let those who are kind of benefiting from it, if you like, off the hook, in in the sense um, in the sense that. We need to make sure also that uh, employers, I mean, whether there might be a kind of a recognized employment relationship, uh, but also uh, quite often there's a, some kind of disguised employment relationship. And I think this is really something where we need to have also more, more clarity that there is also this kind of solidarity um, component between, between employers and, and workers. But definitely, um, I mean, Definitely, um, we need also to make sure that those who are self-employed have um, protection in a, in, a, in a good way. And I think there is, there's a way, especially, um, I mean, the, again, the examples from Latin America are quite, quite interesting. 
I mean, I mentioned the example of Uruguay. In Uruguay, these monotrack um, mechanisms really enabled uh, those who are kind of having a kind of a micro enterprise to be part of the general social insurance um, system in the in the country, and they were able to very easily extend it also, for example, to Uber drivers. So now there there's a mobile app. So for every kind of drive that you, you do on a, on a kind of Uber taxi in, in Uruguay, the social security contributions for the driver are transferred uh, directly to the social insurance. So, I mean, there are ways of actually doing that. And we just need to make sure that it's actually being done and that there's the also the political will actually to do that. And I think with that, we're ready for lunch. Yep. <laughs> so I want to thank the panelists one more time.